you know, how many of you have ever been truly inspired by a mission statement? Right? None of you. Remember, you know, stories inspire. Slides don't. So two examples to help my audience uh, believe that a vision that I had for them was achievable. Uh, this is just a few months ago. I led a team in the uh, paper business, or we call it family care now, so Bounty, Charmin, Puffs, but it's the paper businesses. Um, and the project was a literally a 10 to 15 to 20 year long-term strategy, you know, brainstorming team, essentially. Our job was to chart the really long-term vision for, uh, for our business. And, uh, and it's hard to get people galvanized around that because obviously none of the things you come up with are going to get to market for 15, 20 years and most of us will be retired by then. So it was hard to get people really to be jazzed up about this and even to join the team. So when I finally got my team members assembled, I told them this story. And remember, we're a paper business and I told them a story about another paper business that was started in the year 1865 on the banks of a river in southwestern Finland. And I said, this paper company you know, back then, it started as just a pulp mill, and then pretty soon they added a paper making machine. They started making paper. Well, the two main uh, uses for paper back then was for newsprint, for newspapers, and stationery, for you to write a letter to your mom, right? I mean, th that was the, those were the two forms of communication back then. There was no television, internet, radio, telephone, all that kind of stuff. Newspaper or stationery. So essentially, they were in the communications business, even though they're, they're making paper. Well, Within a decade or two, they had become the, the market share leader for stationery and newsprint in the country of Finland. And they probably thought to themselves, okay, what next? We're, we've like achieved success as much as we can in, you know, here in Finland making paper. And so they started acquiring other companies. They acquired a rubber manufacturing company. And a decade or so later, a cable, a copper cable manufacturing company. Because by that time, uh, teletype or a telegraph, I guess, had been invented. Telephone was maybe not quite there yet, but telegraph had been. So they got into the business of making the cables for the telegraph. And they continued to expand every decade or so into some new business line and, and stayed kind of on the communications front. Well, here it is 140, 50 years later, and this company is not, no longer this tiny little paper-making business in Finland. They are now a global company $40 billion in sales, operating in 120 countries around the world, and every single one of you in this room knows their name because they're known by the same name that they were the day they got founded in 1865, and the name of the company is Nokia. Nokia Telephone. That started out as a papermaking company, as a pulp mill. Okay? So I told that story to my bunch of pulp mill guys in the paper business and said, now, I'm not suggesting that we decide that we're going to make cell phones. The point is that we get to either decide how we are going to expand you know, into the future and make it a choiceful venture like Nokia probably did. They're still international leader in the communications business, it's, but it's changed. Or we can let it happen randomly, or it cannot happen at all. If Nokia hadn't done those things, they would still be the market share leader in the paper business in the country of Finland, a country about the size of the state of Minnesota. Okay? But they're not. They're a huge global success story. So a story can help people understand that, yeah, that is achievable because somebody else did it. 